Welcome back. Today we will talk about derivatives of vector valued functions. This is the first time we've had an actual calculus concept of derivatives coming into this class. So this is an exciting day. Now a vector valued function is just some function that takes real numbers as its input and gives out numbers from some higher dimensional space, Rn. And we saw examples of vector valued functions in the previous lecture, like this one, which you should now be able to recognize as being the graph of a line, since all three component functions are linear. In fact, we could rewrite this like this, breaking it up into the form that we discussed in the last video, where it's patently clear that this is a line. We've got this anchor point, so one particular vector, and then we're adding on all multiples of that vector. And we know that there are other ways we could express a vector valued function. We could have expressed it as a set of parametric equations like this, where I've just pulled each individual component function and made it a function of its own. Of course, vector valued functions are not just for describing straight lines. I gave you an example in the previous lecture like this one, whose graph we saw was a helix. It looked something like this. And I'll remind you that we often think of the graph of a vector valued function, which is going to be some kind of a curve, as being traced out by a moving point in time, which is why we often use t as our parameter for a vector valued function. This brings us to our main question for this lecture. What is actually meant by the idea of a derivative of a vector valued function. I'm not asking how do you compute it, but what does it mean? That's obviously much more important. If you don't know what the thing means, then there's no point computing. To answer this question, it's going to help to go back to just the ordinary derivative of real valued functions that you know from calculus one. Now you know a lot about the derivatives of real valued functions. You know how to define it, you know how to interpret it, so on and so forth. I want to emphasize one particular interpretation that often doesn't get enough play in calculus one classes. Let's say that at a certain point, maybe we'll say this is when x equals 5, the value of our function has some certain value, let's say it's 4, so that f of 5 is 4. The derivative of f at 5 is going to be the slope of the tangent line right there. And drawing this tangent line in, it looks kind of like for every unit, little unit we go over, maybe we go up two of those units. So let's just say that the slope here uh, we're just going to estimate is about two. That much is known by everybody who has passed calculus one. What I want to talk about next though is something you probably know, but maybe you haven't given all that much thought. The idea is that this derivative we can think of as a kind of local multiplier. And to explain what I mean by that, let me give a concrete example. If we concentrate on a tiny little neighborhood of this point right here, uh, an infinitesimal neighborhood, or we could even think of it as a sm very small real neighborhood, and just blow it up, we magnify it to great size. If we do that, then the curve, which is black here, and the tangent line, which is blue, would actually be indistinguishable. Uh, that's the whole idea that, the, the, that drives differential calculus in the first place, that locally curves look like straight lines. So this would be uh, a very local picture of f. Now if from this point I were to move to the right just a little tiny bit, because remember I'm on a tiny tiny scale right here, so if I were to move from 5.4 to say 5.0024, what would happen to the corresponding y variable? I mean increasing x from 5 to 5.002, that little tiny change, that's going to put us somewhere right here on the graph of f. What would the value of the function be right there. When x is 5.002, what would the value of f be? Now I don't have an actual formula for f, so I can't tell you, but nonetheless I can use the derivative as this local multiplier to find out, since I know f's value at a very nearby point. What I could say is that f of 5.002 I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what it is, but I can tell you approximately what it is. The approximation comes from the fact that the curve and the tangent line are not exactly the same, but they are very, very close when we are in this tiny neighborhood of 5.4. Anyway, 5.002, if I run that through the function, what am I going to get out? Of course, what I'm going to get out is going to be close to 4, which was f of 5. So 5.002 is going to be close to f of 5, plus whatever this little change is 
right there. But what is that little change? Well, I could read that off of this picture because I know the slope of this blue line is 2, and I know how far I've gone over, 0 0.002. So this should be approximately 2 times 0 0.002. And since f of 5 is 4, that's going to be 4.004. And again, that's an approximation because the coincidence of the tangent line and the curve is only exact in an infinitesimal scale. What we've got right here is a very, very small real scale. So it's approximately the same, but not quite. Pay special attention to how the derivative turned up here. We saw that f prime of 5, the derivative of the function at 5, was 2. That was information we were given. So when we were over here doing our approximation, we had, well, what's the value of the function at 5 plus a little bit? Well, it's the value of the function at 5 plus, well, we have to take that little bit, and for every unit increase in the x direction, we get a change of 2. We pick up that factor of 2, that local scaling factor of 2, that local multiplier, as I called it before. That is how the derivative shows its face in this problem. And that's really the essence of the derivative, and this is good to keep in mind because it will carry us into all sorts of situations where we can't draw nice pictures and get a feel for the derivative. It's fine in this context where we've got real valued functions. It gets harder when we've got vector valued functions, and then there are other situations where it's hopeless to picture it because the graph exists in more dimensions than we can ever possibly hope to visualize. But if you understand the derivative as this local multiplier, you can understand the derivative in all sorts of contexts that go far beyond what you learned in Calculus 1. So anyway, with that in mind, let's get back to our question. What do we actually mean by the derivative of a vector-valued function? Well, let's draw the graph of one in R3. I always draw some ridiculous knotted up loop like this. All right, good enough. So we'll pretend that this is the graph of some function f, some vector-valued function f. And for the sake of argument, let's say we've got some particular point on the curve, which is f of 3. In other words, when we put the real number 3 into our vector-valued function, we end up with this point in R3. Or as we talked about last time, we would identify that with this position vector extending from the origin to that point. Good, so we know what is meant by f of 3. But suppose we wanted to make sense of the expression f prime of 3, the derivative of our function at 3. What would that even mean? Well, as long as we're thinking of the idea of a derivative as a local multiplier, we can just follow our nose to the answer. The derivative will tell us what happens when we move from this point to another one that is very nearby. So let me put another point in right there. And just to make this concrete, let's say that that point right there is f of 3.0002. The derivative of the function at 3 should tell us something about the approximate value of f at 3.0002, some nearby point. In particular, f of 3.0002 is going to be very close to f of 3 itself. Obviously, these vectors, these two vectors, those points are going to be close together because this is, we're assuming, a nice continuous curve. So it's going to be close to it. What do we have to add on? What vector do we have to add on to that to get there? Since we've changed by 0 0.0002 in our input, we're going to take that 0 0.0002 and we have to multiply by some local multiplier. Well, what is that local multiplier? Whatever that thing is, that is precisely going to be what we mean by f prime of 3. So f prime of 3 is going to be the object that makes this approximation actually work. Well, we can deduce something about it already. The left-hand side here is a vector. That means the right-hand side has to be a vector as well. Well, this bit is a vector, f of 3. This is a scalar. That means this is going to have to be a vector so that their product will be another vector, and we can add it to this vector to get a vector. So we've discovered something interesting already. The derivative of a vector-valued function is a vector. It's not a number. It's going to be a vector. It's still going to be a local magnifier, but it's going to be a vector that does that job. So to put some numbers on this, let's just say, for example, um, suppose that f of 3 was specifically minus 1 to 5. And then let's suppose that this local magnifier, let's say the derivative 
at 3 happens to be 1, 4, 2. Now again, don't worry about where that would go on the graph. Just think about that for now as a local magnifier. If we have those two specific vectors, then I could finish off this approximation very simply because I would just fill in the details like so. Here is f of 3 and here is f prime of 3 and then we just carry out the computations and after a little arithmetic we end up with this vector which is of course very close to f of 3. It had better be because f of 3 and f of 3.0002 are going to be close together because f we're assuming is a nice continuous function. Anyway, since the derivative of a vector valued function is a vector, we would like to figure out geometrically what vector it is. Well, that vector, that multiplying factor, tells us how this point moves in response to little changes in the parameter t. Now, since this is only happening locally on these tiny changes right here, we can think we can figure out exactly where that vector is going to be pointed its direction locally on this tiny scale if we expand this out blow it up our curve remains straight or our curve is straight locally curves are straight that's the central insight of differential calculus so since the derivative tells us how this point moves as we in response to little changes in the parameter t the derivative itself, that vector, had better be pointed along that straight line. And of course, that straight line is going to be nothing other than the tangent line to this curve, because the tangent line just is that straight line that coincides with the curve when we look at it on a local infinitesimal scale. So our derivative, f prime of 3, is definitely moving in this direction, whatever its length may be. And on our actual curve in space, that would mean that the direction of the derivative, again, I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's going to be tangent to the curve at this point. If we drew the tangent line to the curve, the vector would be lying along it. There's a little tangent line to try to emphasize that. Good, so now we know two things. We know that if we have a vector-valued function, its derivative at any point is going to be not a number, but a vector. And we know something about the specific vector. It is going to be a vector that lies on the tangent to the curve at the relevant point in question. In fact, it will be pointing in the specific direction of motion of that moving point that we think about as tracing out the curve. And we could even think about the magnitude of that vector, that tangent vector, that derivative, as being the speed with which the point is moving around. So now if we were to go back to our favorite example of the helix and look at any specific point on that helix, say how about this one right here, which I reached by starting here where t is zero, doing a full revolution and then doing another 45 degrees there, another pi over four, which means that that point right there, that would be f of nine pi over four. So if we wanted the specific coordinates, we could just run it through here, and that would give us, let's see, what would that be? 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 9 pi over 4 would be the coordinates of that point. Or again, more properly, this vector, this position vector pointing from the origin to that point. Okay, but another question we could ask would be, first, how would we interpret f prime of 9 pi over 4. What would that even mean? And then shortly after that we'll ask how would we actually compute the thing, which is the last piece of this puzzle. Well, we know that f prime of 9 pi over 4, this is a derivative of a vector valued function, it's going to be a vector, not a number. And we know something about that vector geometrically. It's going to be a tangent to the curve at the point in question. So it's going to be lying along the tangent line. So whatever the vector looks like, it's going to be something like that. And of course, this vector, f prime of 9 pi over 4, that is a local multiplier, in as much as if we move this point a little further down the road and we want to know what is the approximate uh, coordinates there, we could get that by starting with these coordinates and then taking that little bit of change in t and multiplying it by that vector, and we would end up with an approximation. All this is good, but how do we actually compute it? Let's turn to that next. And let's just say we've got some 
general curve in R3. This argument will work for Rn more generally too. And our goal at this point is to determine the answer to this question. How do we compute the derivative of a vector valued function? Okay, I've got one and suppose I've got some actual formula for it. How do I actually crank out the derivative? Let's say we have two points on this curve that are infinitesimally close to one another. Obviously, I can't draw points that are infinitesimally close, so you have to use your imagination here. But that's the idea. These are so close together that this is a straight line between them. Now, the first point, let's just say that corresponds to this vector right here, which we'll just call f of t, since it's perfectly general. To get to this second point, what we're doing is nudging the parameter up an infinitesimal amount from t to t plus dt, a little infinitesimal amount dt, which means that we'll have something like this for the vector that corresponds to the second point. And I'm going to include one more vector, this little one, which I'll put in green, between the two points. Now that one represents the way in which the value of function f has changed. We went from this vector to this vector. This is the vector we had to add on to this one to get to that. So I'm going to call that new little tiny infinitesimal vector df, an infinitesimal change in f. That's the little infinitesimal increment to f that we get as a result of changing the parameter from t to t plus dt. Now think back to all those approximations we were talking about before, where we approximated the value of a function a little ways down the road, right? a little infinitesimal bit down the road, by using its initial value plus something having to do with the derivative. We're going to do that now. And the thing to remember is that since this is all supposed to be taking place on an infinitesimal scale, what I were calling approximations, they were approximations when we were working on a small real scale, like 0 0.0002 or whatever we were working with. If this is actually infinitesimal, then those approximations can actually be replaced by equalities. And when we run through that argument, what we would get is the value right here after the change f of t plus dt would be the initial value, f of t, where we started, plus some extra little bit. And that extra little bit is going to be dt. Of course, that's the change to the parameter. But then we have our factor that we're multiplying by. That's our derivative, f prime of t. So we have this equation in the abstract. We know that is essentially how we defined the derivative in the first place. Now let me just massage this equation a little bit. Let me rearrange it a little bit. With a little algebra, it turns into this, which is something that we can actually compute and which should look very familiar from calculus one, except that we have these vector valued functions in place of ordinary real valued functions. But every vector valued function has within it real valued functions. Those are the component functions. Namely, if we look at our function f of t, we could always rewrite that in terms of its components as something like this. We have a x component function, a y component function, and a z component function. And each one of these functions is just an ordinary real valued function like you would have met in Calculus 1. We've just wrapped them into this one vector valued package. We can now, however, rewrite the expression over here for our derivative in terms of these component functions. If we actually write these things out, we'll get this which looks uglier because we have expanded out this compact thing into this long, ugly thing. But this is one step closer to real valued functions, which is an area that we are comfortable with already. So if we now do the actual subtraction up here, uh, the result we will end up with is this, which once again may look ugly, but it should be resolving itself into something that looks familiar. Let's actually take this division by dt, which of course we could think of as just multiplication by 1 over dt, it's a scalar multiplication, and push it inside of the vector, do the actual scalar multiplication. When we do so, we come up with this. And now we've got a vector with three components, and look at each component. Each component should look very familiar, because all we're staring at it in each component is literally just the derivative of each component function. If we stripped everything out of this problem except this component function, x of t. We just had some real valued function of one variable uh, in calculus one. I said, how do you compute the derivative of x of t? You would do exactly this. You would nudge it forward a little bit, subtract off the original value, and divide by the change in t. If these are infinitesimal, that's the derivative. If these were small real numbers, you'd have to take a limit as t uh, goes to zero. But the upshot of all of this is that that first component is nothing more than dx dt, 
and the second component is nothing more than dy dt, and the third component is nothing more than dz dt. And now we have our answer. To compute the derivative of a vector-valued function, all we have to do is compute the derivatives of its three component functions and just put them in a vector. And that is it. It is very simple. And thank God, because after all the work you did in Calculus 1, learning how to take derivatives, uh, where you learned the product rule and the chain rule and the quotient rule and all that stuff, you might think, oh God, there's going to be all of this new stuff to learn. It isn't. You just take derivatives component by component. So that is some good news. Let's return to this problem we had before about the helix. Now we've got a very specific function. It's this one right here. We have the vector representation for it. We looked at a particular point on it. It's the result of sticking in 9 pi over 4 into the function. We have that particular point, or we could think of it as a vector. And the question we asked was, what is f prime of 9 pi over 4? What is the derivative of this function at that point? We discussed what that means. It's going to be a vector. It's going to be a vector that's tangent to the curve in the direction of motion of that moving point. But now we want to know what is it? What are the actual components of it? At long last, we know how to do this. We have figured it out. First, we will just compute f prime of t in general, and then we will stick in the appropriate number, all of which should be a piece of cake, because what we have seen is that the derivative of a vector-valued function is going to be another vector, and that vector will have components that are the derivatives of the components of the original function. So the derivative of cosine is minus sine, the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of t is 1. So that is the general expression for f prime of t. More specifically, though, we want to know what is f prime of 9 pi over 4. And since we have these expressions right here, any trigonometry student can tell you that uh, you put 9 pi over 4 into those first two, and let's see, you're going to get minus 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, and of course the 1 just sits there, and we have our answer. One way to read this is that if our moving point were going along the curve like this, and suddenly at when it hit this point, 9 pi over 4, uh, maybe the helix disappeared. It was no longer constrained to move on the helix. It would just be flying off in this direction, because that is the straight line on which it was traveling at that point, since all curves are straight on an infinitesimal scale. And not only would it be traveling in that direction, but the length of that vector tells us something. Every, with every second, so to speak, if we think of t as measuring seconds, with every second it would travel along uh, that distance along that vector. Well, that distance, if you care to actually compute the length of that vector, you'll find that it is the square root of 2. So we would say that at that moment, the moving point is moving at square root of 2 units per second along the curve. And actually, it's not hard to see that on this particular curve, the moving point is moving at a constant speed. Uh, if we look at this parameterization right here, rather than computing the length of the uh, tangent vector at a particular point, just compute it in general when we've got just t here. When we do that, look at what we get right here. We get the square root of sine squared plus cosine squared, which is always 1, plus 1, which is 2. So it would always be moving at that same speed, square root of 2 units per second. So it's nice, constant, steady pace as this thing proceeds along the curve. That's not the usual thing, by the way. Most um, vector-valued functions we would write down, if we just wrote one down at random, we're probably not going to get something that is moving at a constant speed. For example, if we just make up a function like this, and uh, we wanted to know how fast the point was moving at any given position, well, we would just take the derivative, and we now know we can do that component by component. So that's a piece of cake. Uh, and when we do that, we get that. So if we wanted to know the actual speed of the moving point, we call this the velocity vector. So what would be the speed, the length of the velocity vector? And we go through the usual business, uh, square all the various components. And when we do that, let's see, we get 4t squared minus 4t plus 1 plus 1 over t squared plus 1 over 4t. And this clearly is not a constant. For different values of t, you get very different speeds like that. A few last stray thoughts on derivatives of vector-valued functions. Say we have our 
curve that we're looking at, some function f, and we know that we can think of f of t as being a position function, since for any value of t, we get a particular point on the curve, and we know that that point we identify with that position vector right there. But we've also just learned that f prime of t, the derivative of that vector valued function, is a velocity function. It gives us this vector that lies along the tangent to the curve at a point and measures the velocity of the point that moves along it. And of course, its length is its speed. Well, as you know, the rate of change of position is velocity, and the rate of change of velocity, that has its own name, uh, namely, the second derivative of a vector valued function, of course, is just going to be called the acceleration function. And if you are doing physics, you will have lots to say about the acceleration function, thanks to Newton's laws. It's not so easy to draw that vector in a characteristic position because that has to do with how the velocity vector changes when you have a tiny infinitesimal change. I mean, you can kind of get a little bit of a feel that if you moved a bit further down the road here uh, to another point, the velocity vector would be very close to this one, and you would have to think about the change in the velocity and etc 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 so not so easy to depict but very important in practice in physics one last topic i want to mention in this lecture uh, just to get some integrals into the mix and that is arc length suppose we have our curve in r3 or r2 or r90 or whatever and we would like to know given two points on the curve how long is the path between them maybe i'll try to draw that in in red Imagine we traverse that path. How long is that path? You probably handled similar questions in the context of real valued functions when you first met integral calculus. Uh, I'll remind you of how that works in case you didn't. If we were looking at just an ordinary real valued function and we wanted to find the length of the curve between two points, we would imagine breaking that curve up into infinitely many infinitesimally small pieces, right? So that we can think of it essentially as like a, a polygon because each piece would be straight. And the way we would do it is something like this to get a feel for it. Imagine I've got one of those tiny little infinitesimal pieces in the chain, and I'm gonna call that little length right there ds. For whatever reason, s tends to be used for arc length. And I'm gonna blow up that infinitesimal to giant size, where I can actually see what's going on. And so I've got ds right here. Now ds is the result of a little infinitesimal change in the x direction and a little infinitesimal change in the y direction. So now we're staring at this right triangle. Sometimes I've heard it called the differential triangle, which makes me think of like the Bermuda triangle or something like that. Anyway, we get this relationship ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared. This is a relationship between second order infinitesimals. It's only second order infinitesimals in there, so we don't have to throw anything out because they're not being compared with anything larger. And the trick in this particular case is we want to solve for ds, uh, which we do, of course, first by taking a square root. But when we do that, it's not enough just to take the square root. We want to come up with something that we can integrate with respect to x so that we can say, OK, here is what a little infinitesimal bit of arc length is. Now I want to integrate as x runs from here to here. That is the goal. So to do that, I need to get a dx out in front so that I can do an integral with respect to x. How do I do that? Well, to get a dx outside of the radical, I want to factor out a dx squared on the inside of the radical. When I do that, uh, let's see, if I put dx squared here so it'll get kicked out of the radical, I'm left with 1 plus dy over dx squared like that. And now I can drag that other thing out of the radical, the dx squared, and I get this form right here. So ds is equal to all this stuff. You can see how this flows very naturally, right? If you understand just this simple relationship, which comes from this simple picture, you can recover this anytime you need it. And that's really the way you want to think about mathematics in general. It's not a matter of memorizing things because there's only so much your brain can hold and uh, there's no point. It's the ideas. It's not the calculations. The calculations are important, but computers can do those. For any specific example, of course, we would have y is some particular function, and that, y equals f of x, is 
would we would get dy dx from that, square it, and now we've just got an ordinary function of x, put the dx, integrate from wherever a to b, and the job is done. Okay, so that's a brief review. The same kind of idea will hold for a curve in R3 or a curve in R20. Suppose we were to take just a little infinitesimal bit uh, of our curve right here. I'll try to draw it in a different color. Let's just say we have this little blue bit right there, and we're going to blow it up. That's supposed to be an infinitesimal, and when we do so, uh, we're going to end up with... That's not too bad. This is supposed to give a sense of how this little line segment is arranged in space. Moving from here to here, we advance a little bit in the x direction, a little bit in the y direction, and a little bit in the z direction. So not surprisingly, I'll call that edge of the box dx, this one dy, and that one dz. A little bit of x, a little bit of y, and a little infinitesimal bit of z. And that diagonal running through the box is ds. That's a little bit of arc length of our original curve. And I've just noticed that my g somehow turned into a c. Part of it did not register. So let me fix that before we talk about arc length, whatever that is. Our box here is, of course, full of right angles. We've got one there. We've got one here. There are more, but those are the only ones that are important to us. This piece down in the bottom face, well, that's going to be the, the Pythagorean theorem, square root of dx squared plus dy squared. And then when we apply the Pythagorean theorem again to this right triangle, then we actually get ds itself. ds squared is going to be the square of this stuff, which is, of course, just dx squared plus dy squared plus the square of this other leg. So that's going to be plus dz squared. And now we have this relationship exactly like the one we had in two dimensions, except we have this extra component here, dz squared. And once again, anytime we have questions about arc length, I can just massage this around a little bit into whatever form is most appropriate, and we can come up with it. For example, in this instance right here, if we wanted this arc length of this little segment, well, we might think to ourselves, okay, uh, at this first point right here where we started, Maybe let's just say t was equal to a there. And when we ended, t was equal to some other value, b. And so what I would really like to do is to take this expression right here and manipulate it until I have an expression for ds, little bit of arc length, in terms of dt. Because then I could integrate as t runs from a to b. Now, we might say that looks like a much harder job because where is t? t doesn't even appear in this thing. Well, we can get it in there very easily. Let's start by going ahead and taking square roots of both sides just to get ds by itself. And now our job is to put this in a t-friendly form, as it were. So how am I going to get t into this picture? I would ultimately like a dt to be hanging out at the end of it so I could integrate with respect to t. Well, a dt outside is kind of like having dt squared on the inside. And if I'm going to have a dt squared on the inside that gets pulled out, to balance it out and keep this everything equal, I would need a dt squared on the bottom as well under the square root. So that gives me a clue as to how I could proceed. Voila! Now I have an expression that is equal to the preceding one. I've got this dt, which is the same thing as dt squared on the inside, but that would cancel with all these dt squareds underneath. So this is the same thing. And that is the form that will do the job for us. And once again, I would say don't memorize this because you'll forget it in two weeks. Uh, if you're going to memorize anything, remember that, and then you can just manipulate this, make sure you can manipulate it to get it in this correct form, and once you have that, uh, you can go to town with it. Let's do this concrete example. Let's go back to our old friend the helix, but I've only drawn one loop of it, so to speak. It's not really a closed loop. I'm starting here where t is 0. I'm going to go around till t is 2 pi, in which case this is directly above it. And I'd like to know how long is that curve. Well, to solve this, we're going to think, oh, well, it's an arc length problem. Those are all the same. Uh, I break this up into little tiny infinitesimal bits, ds, the little straight bits, and then I know how to uh, come up with an expression for ds in terms of, in this case, dx, dy, and dz. It's right here. In fact, I just did it, and we've got it in this form already. So without any hesitation, I could say that ds is going to be the square of the derivative of this. Well, the derivative is minus sine, so its square is going to be sine squared, plus the square of the derivative of this. That would be adding in another cosine squared. 
plus the square of the derivative of t, which of course would be 1. And we don't want to forget the dt at the end. That is an essential piece so that we can do our integration, although that's going to be particularly easy in this case. Uh, when we put this together, that becomes the square root of 2 dt. So the arc length we seek is, of course, just the sum of all those little ds's. Or in other words, that's going to be the sum of square root of 2 dt as t runs from down here, where t is equal to 0, to up here, where t is 2 pi 0 to 2 pi. And of course, that is a very silly integral, because that's just integrating a constant. So we're going to get 2 root 2 pi units. All right, I think that is enough for this lecture, so we'll stop, and I will see you next time.